cloud. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to um, introduce uh, Andras Tipsik, the speaker of our seminar today. Andras Tipsik uh, did PhD um, in um, US on Donaldson environment with uh, John Morgan, and he spent many visiting positions after that, and in particular in Bonn when I met him long time ago in 95, and I profit very much from conversation with Andras on Donaldson invariance, where I apply something to simplectic topology. Uh, Andras Tipsit is uh, famous uh, for his work on low dimensional topology. He was an um, ICM uh, invited speaker uh, in 2010, right, in Indy. Uh, the grand holder of the prestige uh, ERC grand holder and uh, many other uh, honor. Uh, and uh, today uh, he shall speak about the uh, form a uh, smooth manifold and the notes. Thank but you very much. Thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to share uh, my interest with you although not in person, but at least online. And so I would like to talk a little bit about uh, um, how knot theory connects to four manifolds and what are the tools we are looking for in knot theory and how Lagrangian Fleur homology enters the picture in this respect. And so I start with a few facts which might be, might be called classic, but um, it's good to refresh your memory. So the first theorem I would like to remind you about is a theorem of Friedman from 82. The way he produced it is not exactly the form I am presenting it. So suppose you have <clears throat> two smooth, closed, oriented four manifold and both are simply connected. Then uh, there is a condition under which a Friedman managed to prove that they are homeomorphic, namely the two four manifolds are homeomorphic if and only if they're cohomology rings are isomorphic. Notice that this, this direction, opa, sorry, just a minute. Uh, this direction is, is completely trivial. If you have homeomorphic spaces, of course the, the cohomology rings are, are uh, isomorphic. The converse, however, is a very strong statement. It just says that from homological cohomological data, you are able to provide a homeomorphism. Notice the clash of categories. We have smooth four manifolds, but we can only produce homeomorphisms. This is the typical um, sort of theme in, in Friedman's work. And then you can ask, how can we distinguish you know, homeomorphic, but potentially non diffeomorphic smooth manifolds? And here is an observation. It's not a theorem, but it's an observation that we can define the following function on the second homology. So an observation is that every second homology can be represented by a smooth embedded surface, sigma. And then we just take, so this is where I, what I summarized here, that you give me a homology element, uh, a second homology, then it can be represented by a surface, which is C infinity embedded, sigma is closed and oriented, and then we just take the minimal genus among those representatives. And this gives us a function which I denote by G, and it's called the genus function. And Andras, so, can you make the uh, screen uh, larger? It's uh, a little bit, uh, I don't know, is that, uh, Igor, do you know how to make the screen larger or a little bit uh, hard to read? Maybe just maximize the window, the remarkable window. How do you do that? Uh, it's a Mac. Maybe it has a special button to maximize. <laughs> you? Sure. I have no idea. Maybe I can ask my, my daughter. Oops. Well, um, one of the red, yellow, or green buttons at the top of the window might do something. Red, yellow, or green. At, on the left? Oh. Yeah, one of those. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Okay. Is it better now? <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, so we have this genus function, which associates to every homology class, the smallest possible genus, this particular class can be represented by a surface of that particular genus. And practice tells that this is the information what the, <clears throat> the smooth invariants obstruct or govern. And this is how we can distinguish uh, non-diffeomorphic manifolds that they admit different such function. So that's a nice uh, principle, except it sometimes it will not just work. For example, here is the, the most prominent question, what happens for the force sphere? Of course, we know what this, the second homology of the force sphere is. This is just the trivial group. So the function is, is meaningless. And then we have to look for something else. And this is where knots come in the picture. And so, um, we extend our study in the following way. We have our X as before, a closed uh, smooth uh, four manifold. We can even skip simple connectivity. It's not important. We delete an open disk, a neighborhood of a point. So we get X uh, naught, which is now a four manifold with boundary and the, the, the boundary is just S3. And we consider all knots in this S3. So these are just the standard knot theory. But we associate a, a function, or we define a function on the set of knots. So K is the isotopy, the class of isotopy classes of, of knots. And we send uh, <clears throat> K to the number, which is just the slice genus of the knot. Let me just try to uh, draw what do I mean by the slice genus. So this is S3. This is X naught. And of course I have to reduce dimensions. So these two dots are symbolizing my naught K. And it does bound the surface inside uh, this X naught. And I always assume that this surface is compact, oriented and the boundary. So this is F and the boundary should be exactly K. So this is what we call a, a slice surface. It should be a C infinity surface. And we take the minimum genus of those. And that gives us another uh, uh, function. That's what I call G. And we can, it, it is, this definition has a number of variations. For example, we can demand that we are only considering the H slice or the homologically trivial slice of the, of the knot, where we also assume that the surface represents the zeros homology in, in the relative homology of, uh, of this X naught. So these give you different numbers. Also, we can uh, define a further variant. For example, we can allow the surface to be topologically embedded, which means, and I should uh, sort of uh, elaborate on that because it's not an absolutely trivial notion. So we still have our, our previous situation, the boundary, the knot, and now we consider, instead of a surface, we consider D2 cross a surface embedded into X naught. And uh, this embedding should be C0. So it's only a continuous embedding. <clears throat> and again, we run through the minimal ones. You might ask, why don't I just ask for the topological embedding of, of F itself? That would, that would become a very simple theory even in the tubular neighborhood, the knot bounds a singular disk where you just put a cone on the knot. And this is a very strong singularity. Actually, the singularity itself is modeled on the knot. So we just don't learn anything. But if we require that the surface have a normal bundle, which is equivalent to say that you are embedding D2 cross F, then you get a meaningful definition. And this is called the topological slice genus, again, inside of this four manifold X. And so here is the definition. And uh, so we still have uh, sigma, but now we, we took the, the direct product with, uh, with D2. Okay, so we have these numbers and we hope that they will play the role of the genus function. And so I would like to expose two constructions where they become very uh, convenient. And then we will try to explore them a little more. How can we get small genus knots and how can we obstruct the knot to have small genus? So um, yes, um, so here is an example. 
this is a working example. So suppose that we have a knot K, which has in D4, so this is my four manifold now, D4, and the boundary is S3, and here is the knot. And suppose that this smoothly embedded genus is positive. So this, this the, the, the smooth genus is positive, but the topological one is zero. So you might ask, can this happen? Of course, we all know that in dimension four, topological and smooth are sort of far away from each other. This never happens in dimension two or three, and it's very frequently happens in higher dimensions. And for example, in, in four dimensions, it does happen. And indeed, I in a parenthetical remark down here, I mentioned that such K does exist. I will not give you the K, but it's not very hard to. It's a little bit of a drawing. And then, of course, it's a long run to actually prove these two uh, properties. But suppose we take such a knot. What happens then? My claim is that we can construct a, a, a four manifold which has the, these two properties. So X is not compact anymore, and it turns out to be homeomorphic, but not diffeomorphic to R4. So these are what's called exotic R4s, and you can see that their existence resides on uh, the existence of a knot which has special genus properties. Let me just sketch the idea of how to construct such an X, provided you know that such a K exists. So here is my K, and this big potato is about to symbolize S4. So this is the four dimensional sphere, which can be made of two halves, the upper and lower hemisphere, two D4s. And so what do we know? We know that the topological genus is zero. This means that K bounds in this lower D4, a topologically embedded uh, tubular neighborhood of a disk. So I wanted to emphasize that it's not smooth. So these are these zigzags are supposed to indicate that it's only topologically embedded, okay? So that's what we know. And from that knowledge, I will construct a smooth four manifold using further steps, unfortunately. So the first thing we should do is <clears throat> let's take the complement in, in D4 of this topologically embedded D2 cross D2. So remember, this is D2 cross D2 and C0 embedded in D4. And let's take the complement of that and delete a point. Okay, so this gives us a non-compact four manifold which has a boundary. And there is a very heavy theorem in, in four dimensional topology that non-compact four manifolds always admit smooth structures. Notice that this, this thing seemingly admits a smooth structure from S4, but it doesn't because we deleted an only topologically embedded gadget. So when you want to come up with the charts, it's unclear how to construct them because this topologically embedded uh, D2 cross D2, we intersect these charts in a crazy way. So we need a, a theorem, and indeed there is a theorem that, uh, that non-compact connected four manifolds always admit smooth structures. Somehow in your mind, you can imagine that, you know, the two charts, uh, the transition functions of two charts are not smooth, but then some uh, not very sophisticated calculus tells you that you can locate these problems in a few points. And then you shoot out rays to infinity and you just push the problem into infinity. Of course, if you have to do it infinitely many times, it gives you a problem. So this is why it's a hard theorem. Nevertheless, you can put a smooth structure here and then you glue back the, this other part, which is just D4 and the two handle attached to to this, uh, to, to the zero handle, to the D4. Uh, Andras, let me, uh, sorry, interrupt you. That's a, the existence of smooth structure on non-compact manifold is a classical reason due to whom? So that's not, not so classical. It's also Friedman and Quinn. Uh, Friedman and Quinn, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it uses a, you know, whenever you meet an infinite procedure, like here, you have to handle all the intersections of the charts and you have to push the problems to, to the non-compact infinity. It's, uh, you have to be very careful how to do that. And it's, not, it's, it's a result from the 80s, but it's still a very sophisticated one. And this is what we use here. So this is why it's not a constructive proof of 
constructing an X, it just shows that there is such an X because now you glue back this, this manifold, the D4 attached the two handle along the K and then you get something which you have to check that it's really R4. This is not something very complicated, but it's uh, uh, you need a little bit of uh, thinking. And we claim that this guy, what we created, so away from that point, does not embed into R4. In particular, it cannot, does not embed smoothly into R4. In particular, it cannot be diffeomorphic to R4 because R4 does embed smoothly in R4. And the reason is that if it were embedded in R4, it can be embedded in S4, and there would be this D4, this one, the this two handle inside S4, which would show that the core of the two handle is a smooth slice disk, which would contradict this assumption. So it was a little fast, and the takeaway I would like you to have is that if there is a knot, which behaves different, differently when smooth or topological is assumed, then we can create exotic four manifolds, for example, an exotic R4. You might ask, why don't we create an exotic S4? And we don't know how to do it. In fact, here is another approach, which I will not go into such detail, but suppose you have two knots, K1 and K2 in S3. And, uh, one of them, uh, the, the, this genus, this G is zero and the other one is positive, we can find such pairs. That's, that's not hard, but we also assume that their zero surgeries are diffeomorphic. So this is a three manifold you create from the, from the knot. Then in fact, with a very similar trick as I explained, we can create an exotic S4, a four manifold which is compact, homeomorphic to S4, but not diffeomorphic to it. Uh, sorry. So, Andras, um, you distinguish different smooth structure by uh, new invariant flow homology uh, and the not uh, donation invariant? No, here we, do, we, we distinguish them by the fact whether this gadget embeds or doesn't embed. Of course, uh -huh. when you want to prove this, this inequality up here, this is where you have to use something which is uh, resembling to Donaldson invariants. Uh, these are not exactly Donaldson invariants. I will talk about those invariants a little later. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay. Um, so if, the, uh, if such a pair of knots exists, then we would be in a good position and we could construct a uh, four manifold which contradicts the Poincare conjecture in dimension four. Of course, this is an open problem, so we don't know whether such pairs exist, but as you can see, a very four dimensional problem can be reduced to, uh, to knot theory. Of course, these invariants of knots, we like to call them like 3.5 dimensional invariants. These are three dimensional uh, objects, and the invariants depend on how they behave in the fourth dimensional space. So it's still not something which uh, you can do using only three dimensional arguments. So far so good. So I hope I did convince you that knot theory in some way is an important uh, um, ingredient in, in four dimensional topology, which is my ultimate interest. And so, um, so let me uh, mention a, a result, and then I would like to focus on a construction. So the first uh, result needs a little bit of an introduction. So it was known for a long while that there are exotic R4s, like I showed you before, there are four manifolds which are homeomorphic but not diffeomorphic to R4. If you think a little bit, it brings up a little philosophical question, like why do we do physics in the, space-time R4, the Euclidean R4, there are other smooth manifolds which have the same topological properties, but let's put that aside. And let, we can we classify uh, exotic R4s into two categories. The ones they embed in R4 and the others which don't. In my previous construction, I gave an example of the later, but there are uncountably many of the first type. So yeah, we, people did that distinction and we can do the same with an exotic D4. 
you, you know the difference. This is a non-compact manifold and D4 is compact with boundary. And we can ask, you know, is there an exotic manifold, an X, which is homeomorphic to our D4, but maybe not uh, diffeomorphic. And we call it small if it still embeds into the standard D4 and we call it large if it doesn't. So here is a, a, a theorem which uh, we uh, found with Alberto Cavallo, a former student of mine like a year ago. So if you have a small exotic D4, where the existence is unclear, we don't know whether such exists, then the slice links are the same. So what do I mean by that? So we take all the knots or links in S3 and slice is when this, this function is, uh, is zero. So there is a natural extension for links as well, which I didn't touch, but you can imagine that every component should bound a, a smoothly embedded disk. And this uh, statement just tells us that unfortunately, you know, there is no genus function on homology and even the genus function on knots will never distinguish them. So it's sort of a negative result. If you have a small such exotic guy, we have no idea how to distinguish them. At this moment, we don't know any invariant or any method or any you know, roundabout way to distinguish them. On the other hand, if it is large, and unfortunately we have a very strong uh, condition here, geometrically simply connected, which means that it's not only simply connected, but admits a handle decomposition where there are no one handles. If you remember from your topology studies, how do you compute the fundamental group of a CW complex? You take the one cells as generators and the two cells as relations. And this is just a geometric way of saying that simple connectivity, you can do it for a, uh, for a simply connected space most of the time, you can find a CW complex where there are no one cells. It's unclear whether you can do it without one handles, where handles are sort of a geometric counterparts of cells. So this is a very strong assumption, but the upshot is that if there is an exotic D4, which is large and geometrically connected, then there is a link, which is slice in, in this exotic guy and not slice in D4. So the message is that for this kind of exotic D4s, there is a chance, provided you can obstruct sliceness of, uh, you have a very powerful method of obstructing sliceness of knots and links. So this is what I would like to uh, talk about in, in the rest of the time. Before doing that, however, let me show you a way to construct slice knots. So I would like to give a construction of knots which do bound embedded C infinity embedded disks in D4. So the construction is, is quite obvious. You just take a couple of unknots and you just line them up. So I took N of those in S3, okay? And then you take N minus one bands and you connect, you know, a band is just, just a band and then you attach it to the circle like in this way something like this, it can pass through the other guys and eventually ends up on one of them. And if you have N such circles and you use N minus one bands, you can do it in a way that the result becomes a connected knot. It's, it's a little bit resembles to the fact that if you have a graph on N vertices and you have N minus one edges, you can do it in a way that you get a tree. That's what exactly you do, except it's more geometric because you are, you are not only recording what circles are connected by the band, but you also have to remember how the band looks like. And it can go all kinds of crazy stuff, like it can be knotted itself and does all kinds of uh, horrible things. It's not very hard to see that whenever you do such a uh, construction, the resulting knot will be a, a genus zero knot, a slice knot. In fact, the, the end results of such constructions have a different name and they are called uh, ribbon. 
So these are ribbon knots. And it's a very old question in the in the in this story whether ribbon knots, which are always slice, whether in this construction you get all the slice knots. And it's unknown. This is a conjecture of Fox from the 60s that these two notions slice, so the genus is zero and ribbon, so it's given by this construction. These two things are the same. We don't know the answer. I should mention that it would be very, very confusing if the answer is yes, if this, uh, if this conjecture would be true, because sliceness is somehow a four-dimensional property. Ribbon is a three-dimensional construction, and or expertise tell that three dimensions is quantitatively simpler than four. And it would be very surprising if for knots, the two notions would be the same. Nevertheless, it is possible. And we don't have any good invariants which would detect the difference, which would say be zero for ribbon, but potentially not zero for slice. And we don't have any good candidates either. But that's very common in four dimensional topology that you don't know nothing. And you have examples, and then you don't see the big picture. OK, so um, the, what, what, uh, what I wanted to explain so far is that knots are, <clears throat> are very important uh, ingredients of four-dimensional topology, and especially this, this notion of what is the minimal genus surface they bound in the four-dimensional space, and particularly when do they bound the disk. And uh, I just gave you a construction of many, many of these examples. But we would like to also find obstructions for knots to bound disks. And that's, this is typically the hard part. And this is where these invariants, uh, you were referring to Donaldson invariants, Cyberwit invariants come into the play. So all these invariants are designed to obstruct. They never provide you anything constructive. They just tell you that some things cannot happen. And so, um, well, <clears throat> this construction is now based on Lagrangian fleur homology. So I chose this to be the second part of the talk, how to come up with uh, invariants, uh, various invariants of knots and three manifolds and potentially four manifolds using this picture. This whole story was initiated and developed by uh, Peter Ojwat and Zoltan Sabo starting around 2001, and this is a still an ongoing procedure. And so here is the, here is the rough construction. I will, I will sweep a lot of details under the rug, but if you have any practice in FLIR homology, then you will detect where the problems are. And maybe I will make a, a little, a few remarks. So first of all, when you want to come up with invariants of any kind of objects, you have to present them in some way. So in this case, we would like to associate homology groups to knots and links. So we would like to present knots. Now I will focus only on knots in some way. So I claim that the following is a good presentation. We take the following five tuple, which I will denote by script age, and I will call it a Hagar diagram. And the five tuple consists of the following five items. So we, Andras, that in three dimensional, right? Hagar diagram for three minifone and the knot. Yes, exactly. Is it, uh, shall I give the details or you? No, no, I should ask you because you come from the four minifone and then go to two or uh, three. So you will see how this connects to four, okay. four minifones. So this indeed, this will be this will present the boundary of a four manifold, and now we would like to find an obstruction that it bounds a disk inside the four manifold, and we will do it in a very restrictive uh, way. But so sigma is now a two-dimensional surface, alpha underscore uh, of genus G, that's my genus. Um, Alpha underscore is a collection of, of G circles in the, in, the, in the surface. And these are simple closed curves, and they have the property that their complement is connected. It takes only a few minutes to realize that it is uh, equivalent to say that they are linearly independent in homology, or saying that if you do surgeries along these curves, 
then you turn your sigma into S2, into the sphere. And you take another collection beta of the same properties and two points outside of alpha and beta. So this is a very convenient and tamely looking uh, uh, object, which presents a three manifold together with the knot. Well, I will not explain exactly how it is presented by, how does it present a, a three manifold, but suppose we start with a three manifold and we have a Morse function on it, okay? Which is self-indexing, takes the maximum and the minimum into zero and three. And it has a couple of index two critical points and index one critical points. And then we take the, uh, the middle level and that will be my surface. And then I take the, the gradient flow of the Morse function. So for this, I need to fix a metric. So I fix a metric also. I take the flow equation and I flow down from the critical, from the index to critical points. And I flow up from the index one critical points. The first will give up me beta. The second will give me alpha. And the two points will give me two flow lines which then will form a knot. It seems like this is the unknot because this is how I drew it. But if you pick at a tricky Morse function, then actually you can get any knot you like. So the three statements I want to say is that any such diagram represents a pair of a three manifold and a knot. Um, any pair appears in this way and indeed, if you have two presentations of the same three manifold knot pair, then there are a few moves. You can go from one presentation to the other, and so you can connect them. It's a little bit like uh, if it is, uh, I don't know whether it rings a bell, but there are these Prydemeister moves, which says that if you have two diagrams of the same knot, then there are a few changes, easy changes, elementary changes, which turn one into the other. And the situation is exactly the same, except the moves are a little more complicated. You have to change the curves, and then you sometimes you have to change even the surface. These are called handle slides and stabilizations, if this uh, sounds familiar. And so whenever we would like to produce an invariant, what we should do, somebody gives me a Y and a K, I look for an age which represents them, I do some, some Fleur homology, it produces an invariant, it produces something, and I have to check that under these moves, this something is invariant. And that's what we have to do. And then of course, you might ask things about, uh, you know, how natural these choices are and how natural the isomorphisms are. And this brings us into the forest of complications in topology and in Fleur homology. Well, we don't want to do that. I will just give you a rough sketch. So where do we do Fleur homology? What are the, the spaces? Well, so we have this five tuple. So from now on, when I think of a three manifold and a knot, secretly I think of a, a surface, two sets of curves and two, two points. And to which I, I associate a five tuple of spaces. Namely, I take sigma, and I take the g-fold symmetric power of this genus G surface. Notice that, uh, of course, if you know the story, then it's not so surprising, but if you hear it for the first time, symmetric powers are typically very singular spaces, right? How do you construct them? You take the Cartesian product, and then you factor by the symmetric group. And this is a nice smooth manifold, and this is a nice group which horribly acts on that space. It's by far not free. For example, the diagonal, when you pick the same point from every sigma, is a fixed point for everybody, while if you have different points, then they don't have fixed points. So it's a horrible stratified space in general, except in one dimension. And this dimension is exactly where we are. If sigma is two-dimensional, then it's a nice smooth manifold, for example, if you run the same business for C, for the complex line, then this turns out to be C to the G. So it's a vector space. And the reason is the fundamental theorem of algebra, because you take monic polynomials and you can 
parameterize them by the roots, which give you an unordered G tuple because of the fundamental theorem of algebra, or you can parameterize them by the coefficients where you do have an order. And both sets uniquely determine the polynomials. So the monic polynomials give you a bridge between these two. So you should expect that in dimension two, everything is nice. And then what I explained here in other dimensions, things are not nice, but this is what we do have in topology, that's okay. So we have this and then the alphas and the betas, which I did give them an order before, but they don't come with a natural order. For example, in the Morse theory picture, they are completely unordered. They give you tori in this symmetric power. If you take only the Cartesian power, then either you pick an unnatural ordering or you just consider the tori for every possible order. And then you have a subset which has G factorial components. And then you have no idea how to count intersections. So it's, this is really the natural thing. So we have a, a 2G dimensional, real 2G dimensional space and 2G dimensional tori inside. And the invariant motto is to understand how do they intersect? Of course, you know, if you only consider the intersections, then homology theory will tell you. But we would like to understand how do they intersect as special submanifolds. And to that end, we would like to equip sim G with a symplectic structure. And we have to think a little bit. It's not absolutely trivial because, of course, the Cartesian product does admit a symplectic structure, which can be derived from a symplectic structure in sigma. But when you take the quotient, then this two form becomes singular. So you need a little more advanced technology. And we would like to these two submanifolds to be Lagrangian submanifolds. And once again, you can do that, but it requires a little bit of a work. If you think about, you know, if you fix one symplectic structure once and for all, then it's unclear whether for any choice of alpha and beta, this, this tori will be Lagrangian. The story is that you can take the, uh, the symplectic form on the product, you can equip it with a Kähler form, and then there is a way to uh, define a Kähler form on that quotient, which is uh, uh, outside of a sufficiently small neighborhood of the diagonal, is the same as the quotient of omega. Near the diagonal, you have to do something. And then the size of that, that neighborhood of the diagonal will depend on the alpha and the beta. So it's a longer story, but luckily people just work that out in Kähler geometry. So you are in the position to run the Lagrangian Fleur uh, construction and you construct an invariant. Of course, you might ask, where, where are these? What, what is the role of Z and W? And the point is that they define divisors in the, in the symmetric power. Notice that we can take sort of those G tuples where one of the guy is your chosen point, is, is, is W. So we take sim G minus one cross, cross W and the same for Z. So the picture you have to have in mind is this. So we have this, this fantastic symplectic manifold equipped with the appropriate symplectic structure. We have two half-dimensional submanifolds, T alpha and T beta. They have very simple topology. And there are two further submanifolds, uh, VZ and VW somewhere. And of course, my picture doesn't show that this is real 2G dimensional. This is G, G, so you can assume that they intersect transfer, transversely. And these guys are 2G minus two dimensional, right? These are complex, these are divisors. So you, you should see the, the relation between the dimensions. And now we run the uh, Hegart Fleur machine, or sorry, the Lagrangian Fleur machine for the triple uh, sim G, T alpha, T beta. And in the boundary, I will somehow uh, give a role to these two divisors. As in the boundary in a Fleur homology, you count holomorphic disks, you expect that they will intersect those in finitely many points, and that will help us. So here is what we do. 
sorry. Um, so we take some ground ring, which most of the time in this talk, it will be always the, the ring of Loran polynomials. And for simplicity, the coefficient, as you always do in, in Lagrangian Fleur homology, you pick just Z2, and then you don't have to worry about orientations, even on the price of losing a little bit of an information, which I should add in Hegat Fleur homology is not confirmed that you really use, lose information. Somehow, if you push through the theory with Z coefficients, which brings in a lot of extra complication, you don't see any more than as opposed to the field coefficient where the field is of two elements. So we don't really understand the reason for that. And there should be a very deep mathematical reason, which we don't see yet. Yes, Jack, uh, Andras, so uh, is, uh, is uh, can you uh, construct a, a flow homology is coefficient in Z, yeah? Say it again, sorry, I didn't understand. You can have the flow homology is an uh, uh, integral coefficient. The coefficient. Yeah, you can, you can. And you can run this, this whole thing and you get other invariants. And somehow you never, so far, nobody got more information. So a priori there is no like interest in torsion type of phenomena or anything like that. A priori they are there and like nobody saw them. It's like, okay, an, you know, elephants are there, but when you run around in Hungary, you never see them. So, and it's unclear. And there is a good reason to expect that maybe there is a good mathematical reason for not having torsion at all. So it's a mystery, but so for simplicity, I, I just wanted to say that I'm not skipping Z because, uh, uh, you know, the theory does not extend. It does extend, but it does not seem to bring anything new to the table. So your ground ring is FUU inverse, the Loran polynomials with coefficients in this two element field. And maybe I should uh, add what is the, the boundary map. So you take uh, a generator of the Fleur homology, which is supposed to be uh, an intersection point of the two Lagrangians, a little bit of a uh, observation that they will intersect transversely provided your alpha and beta curves on sigma, so the two on the two dimensional surface intersected transversely. So that's a, that's a condition we will always assume. And so what's the the bound what's the the boundary map here? Well it should run through uh, all the other intersection points and uh, it will be the count of holomorphic maps from the disk to this symplectic manifold, which connect uh, the two intersection points. So I will write it like this. So we take all the homotopy types of disks which connect the two intersection points. We take one such homotopy type, we represent it by holomorphic disks, and we count the number provided the corresponding Maslow index is one. Then we expect this quotient space. Remember that uh, um, this uh, the moduli space of holomorphic disks always admits an R action because of the symmetry of the source. And so the hat is just when you quotient out by that. I'm really unsure how much Fleur homology should I add here. Uh, Andras, uh, I, I only have to say, uh, learn a little bit about the instant flow homology, but uh, what you're saying is completely different, right? Yeah, it's Lagrangian fleur homology. It's a nice occasion of Lagrangian fleur homology with an extra twist, which I didn't write, unfortunately. So I will Lagrangian write. homology is um, how you identify it's a, 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 that is a, like an instant flow homology? No. So if you have a symplectic manifold. Yes, I, I know. Symplectic, but how you put it, I maybe I miss some point. How you make the of symplectic structure here? So you have a symplectic structure on the symmetric power. It's it's a Kähler. You equip sigma, which is yeah. a if you equip it with a complex structure, and actually you equip it with a Kähler structure, yeah. then this one will be a Kähler manifold. Uh, I, uh, so that's a, a sigma here, that's a check uh, Riemann surface. It's a Riemann surface. I see, okay. It's actually a Kähler. You also fix the symplectic 
and the, 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 the complex structure, and then this will be a Kähler manifold. Uh, so that is a, uh, um, this, uh, how, how, how called this uh, Fleur homology? I mean, that's uh, related to, uh, to uh, geometry of three di uh, dimensional manifolds. So there are too many Fleur homology. I mean, that's, uh, that is classic on Fleur homology from the um, Lagrangian Fleur homology, but how to associate to the geometry of three and four manifolds. That's a uh, low uh, introduction. This close, because I didn't write one term in the boundary map because we, we have these two extra divisors, right? And the question is, how do you use that? And here is how you use it. You inter we introduce the formal parameter. We are not working over a field. We are working over the Laurent polynomial ring, right? And so in the exponent, I put how many times this phi intersect W. Okay, so there is this divisor and then the question is, we, we also record how many times a holomorphic disk intersects that. Other than that, it's an absolutely standard Lagrangian third homology. Yes. So, you know, people studied that. And of course, when you take a random symplectic manifold and two random Lagrangian submanifolds, then the Fleur homology typically doesn't exist because there, are, there might be boundary bubbles and there are all kinds of technical difficulties. And these difficulties are present here, but luckily, for example, the boundary bubbles, they cancel each other. Somehow, these are very special Lagrangian submanifolds. They are tori, and you can have a diffeomorphism of the entire space, which transforms one into the other. So you might hope that these, you know, relative Gromov-Witten invariants, which count the boundary bubbles, they are the same for both. So if you work over F2, the field of two elements, luckily they will just cancel each other. If you work uh, over Z, then you have to figure out an orientation convention such that the alpha boundary bubbles will cancel the beta boundary bubbles. It can be done. It's uh, it's not an amusing, but at least it's a true theory. So, but that the symmetric the power is actually our before, right? You told us stratified space, but it's a uh, our before because the kosher. Yeah, but not, not in dimension two. In dimension two is a smooth manifold. Yeah, okay. Unfortunately, of course, you are, you, you are right that there is a subspace, you know, the, the diagonal where you have multiple entries. And uh, in the technical term, this diagonal has to be that differently. Luckily, the two uh, uh, Lagrangians absolutely avoid the diagonal because they are disjoint circles in sigma. So it's, it's pretty much a standard Lagrangian Fleur yes. homology, except there is this term, which somehow records how many times you intersect this extra divisor. So this gives us a chain complex. Okay. And we can equip this chain complex with a filtration because notice we only use W. In the proof, I only use W, but I have two points. In order to have a knot, you have to have two points. If you only have one point in this, uh, in this picture of mine, then you don't have a knot, you just have an arc, right? Sorry, so I erased probably too much. But if you have an arc, it doesn't tell you what the knot was. You need both. And it turns out, that this is exactly what you can do, except uh, this, this other uh, dot will give you a filtration. So together with a filtration on this chain complex. So, um, well, I didn't give a name. Here I did give a name. This is the, the traditional name of the chain complex. This, uh, this is, chain complex Fleur for knots and infinity is because you also have U and U inverse. I don't know the, you know, the etymology, how this, this has been developed, but this is the convention. So, um, so at the end of the day, uh, you are always referring to instant on Fleur homology. You don't see the connection here. You know, this is, uh, this is something a little bit different and it has a slightly different roots. It's more, related to the Casson invariant, if that uh, rings a bell, where you have a three manifold, you have a, a, a Hagar splitting, 
and then you take the representation variety of, sig of sigma, and then two Lagrangian submanifolds, yep. representation which extend up or down, we have something similar, but not exactly, because for example, the representation space has a singularity at the trivial representation, because you don't really take the representation space, you take the character variety, right? And so here, you don't have that. You do have the resemblance by taking the diagonal, but you either remember or you don't, it's up to you. The space itself is nice and, and dandy. It's a smooth manifold by, thanks God, the fundamental theorem of algebra, right? It's like, you know, Gauss, you see the hand of Gauss in this story. Um, okay, so what do we have? We have this, uh, this, this chain complex, which is filtered, and the filtration refers to the knot. If you forget about the filtration, then you only have a three manifold invariant. It turns out to be graded. I will not talk about the grading, but it's not something very complicated. And, uh, and the fact is that the filtered chain, graded chain homotopy type of that chain complex is a knot invariant. So the chain complex itself will depend on the chosen uh, the, the chosen Hegar diagram, but the chain homotopy type, this is usually what happens in, in, in Fleur homology, that the chain complexes are different. If you apply a Lagrangian, oh, sorry, a Hamiltonian isotopy, you change the chain complex, not the chain homotopy type. And that, therefore, people usually take homology. Well, now you have two options. You can take the homology, which will not see the filtration. So you will get something which is an invariant of the three manifold. And it turns out to be not a very exciting invariant. It will be determined by the cohomology ring of the three manifold. Or you take the homology of the graded object, the associated graded object. So you use this filtration in this way, or you just keep the filtration as it is. And this is what we will do. And now, <clears throat> What you can do is to mix the grading with the filtration. So whenever you have a grading, you can turn it into a filtration by saying that filtration level is all the guys which have grading less than something. So indeed, you can view this object as a doubly filtered chain complex, and two, chain, two filtrations can be mixed. You can take you know, one with certain weight and the other with another weight and to mix them. And this leads us to a function. So I will not go into the definition of this function because I think I will run out of time, but maybe I can, I can say a few words about that a little later. And so I would like to tell you two theorems which came out of this and one corollary. The first is that, you know, we would like to have a, <clears throat> an obstruction for sliceness. So it would be fantastic if this filtered or bifiltered chain complex has a special form for slice knots. And indeed, this is exactly what happens. Here is the theorem that if K is slice, so K is the boundary of a disk inside D4, then the chain complex is filtered chain homotopy equivalent to something where you have a, the, the, the standard, the, the ground ring with boundary zero together with an A, which is acyclic. So somehow the homology completely uh, localizes to that factor. Okay, so this, this is some, uh, you might ask, how can I check it? Well, it's not so easy to check for a randomly chosen uh, chain complex over this Laurent polynomial ring, but there are ways to actually check that, that it, it has this, uh, this property. So this gives us an, an obstruction, right? It, we cannot prove that a knot is sliced because it doesn't give us the slice disk, but we can prove that a knot is not sliced if this particular invariant doesn't have that structure. By mixing the, the two gradings, we can come up with a function which we can associate to the knot with this, uh, this uh, we call it the epsilon function of the knot, and maybe I will tell you a little more later. And so here is the, the, the other obstruction that if 
sorry, I forgot to add the same uh, assumption. If K is slice, then this is the constant zero function. There are other functions like that. For example, the levin tristam signature of a knot has the same property. That only depends on topology. So somehow it gives you the same result whether you ask for topologically slice, so it bounds a C0 embedded disk or smoothly. This guy is very sensitive for, for uh, only smoothness. And so this will be my, my last uh, slide to give an application of that, that function for, uh, for uh, knots. <clears throat> so let's take the set of all knots up to isotopy. It turns out that if we ignore, if, if we quotient out by slice knots, then we will get a, a, a group. It's called the concordance group of, the smooth concordance group of knots. It's a horrible group. You know, I mean, this is, this is an ongoing saga in low dimensional topology that you can define groups. And if they are nice and geometric, then their structure will be very complicated. For example, this one is an abelian group, which is not finitely generated. And, you know, it took me a lot of time to develop a respect to not finitely generated abelian groups. If you have a finitely generated abelian group by Frobenius theorem, it's a sum of cyclics. So it can be described by a, an easy n tuple of numbers, you know, the, the, the orders of the cyclic factors. And there might be infinite cyclics, that's fine. If it's a non-finitely generated uh, abelian group, then it can be horrible. You know, a typical example is Q, right? This is a not finitely generated abelian group. There are ZP infinities, if, if you know what, what I mean. And uh, there are <clears throat> mixtures of those and a lot more. It's a zoo. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's very hard to, to, to understand them. And we have one of those. So uh, my theory is that the concordance group was created on the last day of creation when God was tired and didn't pay too much attention and created this group. And it's uh, probably, it's very hard or even impossible to understand. Of course, you can immediately define two versions of that, whether you take the smooth slice knots or the topological slice knots. And this is a much cruder equivalence relation. There are many more C0 maps than C infinity. So there is, a, there is an obvious map between the two. And you might ask, what's the, what's the kernel? Notice that the kernel is exactly those knots which I used when I built the exotic R4. Those are the guys which topologically slice, topologically in zero, but smoothly non-zero. So a non-trivial kernel element is exactly what we needed before. And so our theorem with, with Peter and Zoltan says that the kernel is a subgroup, it's, a, it's an abelian group, and it's isomorphic to Z infinity plus some unknown abelian group. So this is a very typical theorem to say that it's very complicated. It contains as a direct summand a Z infinity factor. So when I said that there is an example, I, I was rather modest, right? Even up to this equivalence relation, there are infinitely many linearly independent such examples. So we can have lots of constructions of exotic R4. Of course, whether they are different, we don't know from that story. <clears throat> so um, so th this, this is the application we can have using this, uh, <clears throat> this function, which is a, a smooth invariant of a, of a knot, uh, which takes its four-dimensional behavior into account. And, uh, and so I, let, let me finish by just listing that what are the, uh, <clears throat> the open questions I mentioned and they are still open. So there is this question whether my construction of slice knots com covers all slice knots, whether slice and ribbon are the same, no clue. Is there an exotic S4? Well, I tried to convince you that the usual genus function will be very, it's, it's not helpful. <clears throat> the, the punctured four manifold together with these knots and their genus function 
might be handy, and we don't know. And uh, the same question works for CP2. This is also a very convenient, very nicely constructed, simple four manifold. We have no idea what to do. And indeed, if you take the n fold connected sum of CP2, this is wide open. So if you allow indefinite form, so you take some CP2s and some CP2s with the reverse orientation, then we know a lot of stuff. But if you insist on, on definiteness, then or, no, or, or knowledge is very, very limited. And we don't even have good candidates. So I hope that by pushing further these not theoretical invariants, we can shed light maybe to that or for some end to this. The ultimate goal is of course this question. That would be, you know, if they ask me, what is the mathematical question I want to know the answer 100 years from now, probably this would be the one. So I think this is the point I would stop and uh, I would be happy to answer questions provided I know the answer. Yes, so let us th thank you very much, uh, Andra. Yeah, so you're very interesting talk. So let us thank the speaker. So Andras, uh, I have um, uh, the um, two questions. The first, that uh, you say about this uh, new uh, flow homology that is uh, constructed by you uh, or, or no, so first of all, this Fleur homology, I mean, you know, in my mind, Fleur homology is a machine. You bring your own symplectic manifold, you throw in, you have to check a few things, what happens with the bubbles, but this was constructed by Ojvat and Sabo. Mm -hmm. And it works for every three manifold. In fact, for every three manifold equipped with a knot, indeed, every three manifold equipped with a link. Uh, there you have to modify a little bit how to code the link, but this was this is their work where we we used uh, some ideas to <clears throat> to do this uh, this double filtration and then to come up with with this function. This is where my role come in. You know how okay. to refine this invariant. How to they they had the the doubly filtered chain complex. What can you do with that? This is more like an algebra, but then of course you want to see the connection to topologies. For example, this one, and then how you compute it and how you use it in, in particular questions about knots in, in, in S3. And then it would be nice to extend this theorem when you know the, the knot is not slice in D4, but in some other four manifold. And we have no idea. We still trying to figure out how to get some characterization of those knots, which happened, you know, this is a very non-trivial assignment because for example, if you take enough CP2 and enough CP2 bar, then every knot is sliced. So it, it should be, uh, it should do something with, uh, with cyber witten or adults on theory of the ambient four manifold. So it's a very subtle, subtle question and uh, we are at the moment completely in the dark. And uh, I have the second question. That's, uh, I read some uh, long time ago the paper by uh, Robert Gold on the uh, Donaldson, uh, not Donaldson, Poincare uh, the connection in dimension four. So you also mentioned about this, yeah? The unique net. So he, he, I don't know who, 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 is, who is that? No, no, I mean, Aroba Gomf. Oh, Gomf, Gomf, yeah. I mean, you know, <clears throat> everybody works in his own way on the smooth Poincare conjecture. And uh, there is no consensus whether it's, uh, whether it's unique or finite or infinite. For Can you use the, your invariant to, cons uh, do you think that's a unique, uh, not unique, and you use the invariant to, Distinguish different smooth structure, or you tend to think that's a unique? I don't think it's unique, but this, there is no good reason for that. I will, I just would be very surprised that S4 is so different from all the other four manifolds, but that's a very weak reasoning. In the three dimensional case, there was somehow consensus among mathematicians, mostly because it fit in a much bigger picture, you know, it, would, it was part of Thurston's geometrization. And 
mathematicians have the tendency of believing more complicated things because especially if they come with a structure. Here, it would be a very, very surprising thing. And I have no idea how to prove that S4 has a unique structure. To prove that it doesn't have a unique structure, well, for that, I do have candidates. Yeah, yes, that, exactly. I think that you could use your invariant. It's just, we don't have, so there, I didn't talk about, uh, <coughs> sorry, how to construct potential candidates. And whenever you construct one and you spend enough time with it, you realize that it's either standard or the invariant will not distinguish, or you have no idea. And these are the three options. So it's, a, well, you know, it's a complicated, four dimensions is complicated, despite whatever people say, so. I think, yes. So, if there are some more questions. Andres, uh, I would like to ask you a basic question. So, you mentioned this uh, uh, story with a uh, torsion that uh, it should potentially uh, not exist or not be important. And you mentioned that there is some reason for that. So, deep reason. And uh, maybe it's not like a completely done or whatever, but could you please uh, say precisely what you meant? Yes, so what, what happens is that, well, so first of all, I was lying. This is always the case. So if you take a three manifold with a very large B1, then there is torsion, but the torsion doesn't come from the homology. It comes from some background structure. So it's, it's actually there, but morally it's an uninteresting torsion. What we start to understand is that if you restrict yourself to knots in S3, then we don't see any torsion. And Zoltar has a program which checks for, I don't know, 350 million knots with crossing number at most 20 and never appear. I mean, it's hard to say that there is no torsion. What he does, he computes mod two and mod three. And so it always comes out to be the same. So. You know, there is no mod two torsion and no mod three torsion, or they happen at the same time. So, and the deep reason is this, that you somehow can replace a version of this invariant by a geometric object, which is a torus together with an Im embedded curves or more precisely a train track, whatever that is. So these curves might have, you know, such bifurcations and <clears throat> you, you can, take two of those and then their Lagrangian intersection will compute the actual groups. And, uh, you know, do Lagrangian intersection in T2 with simple closed curves, there is not much room and they will never have torsion. So, but there is no proof that this picture will exactly give back because there are local systems involved and there are all kinds of technicalities, but somehow this project is converging to the fact that in general, we don't know about the torsion, but at least for knots in S3, we never see it. And maybe we will have a proof eventually that they don't exist. So, but of course you have to sort out orientations for these things, you know, it's, a, it's the usual yoga of, of Lagrangian flare homology. Thank you, thanks. So if there are no more questions, let us thank the speaker again, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so I, I only did, I think that I, I, I stopped. Uh,